Um, but anybody who does need subtitles or prefer subtitles, you can turn those on. It's like I said, it's usually a day or two after um, after it gets posted to YouTube that uh, that the automatic captions go through there. And if there's something that looks like it's not right and you're still having a hard time seeing what I'm or understanding what I'm saying, let me know and I can look at the transcript and uh, and see if it's messed up anywhere. Um, and for those of you guys who came in in the middle of that conversation, I did just post your practice midterm that you will have instead of a quiz this week. Um, next Thursday is the time that you're scheduled to have the midterm. Um, I think the way that, so the way that I'm going to set this up is so that the midterm will go live Thursday morning, probably Thursday at midnight. I'll have it set up on Wednesday. Um, so that any time on Thursday, between Thursday morning and um, Sunday at midnight, you can take the midterm from ne for next week, not today. Um, so it's a, a week later than normal because um, next week is week seven. And so you're going to be taking it at the end of week seven as opposed to the end of week six. Um, but that's kind of where the, where the material has a nice breaking point. Um, and so that the last few lectures, um, were, I think everything that's on the test, we're going to cover today or in this set of slides, we might not get to everything today, but we'll be able to finish it up on Tuesday. And then that'll leave Thursday's lecture for anybody who doesn't want to just jump in next Thursday and take the test first thing in the morning. Um, the wheel we can set that up as a review sec um session and we can even do something crazy like meet at 8 30 instead of at 8 a.m um give you guys an extra half hour of sleep um and if you haven't had one of my review sessions before the, it's basically just going to be um you guys asking questions i'll we'll do practice problems as long as you guys want and uh sorry let me switch my chairs um and uh, that that will work out, I think, pretty well. Um, just if you if you guys don't have questions to go over, though, we then the review sessions typically are really quiet. Um, but almost always, somebody will have something that they want to go over. Um, so that's that's a plan for the next week. Finish this this set of slides, and maybe a couple more slides. I might have to add to this on on uh, mechanisms. Um, and then that will be, that will be all the new material on the test. All right. Any, actually, let me check the schedule real quick, see what we had on the, um, yeah. So I, in the next Tuesday's lab as well, it's just more exam review. We're not doing a new lab assignment next week. So that'll give you a chance to, uh, catch up on on anything that you're um any assignments you still have outstanding midterm your midterm makes a really good um gives you really good deadline for yourself if you've already missed the deadline to get stuff turned in make yourself the deadline of i'm going to get all my late assignments turned in by next thursday um and so you can use that time next tuesday in lab to finish up on anything you still have outstanding um any questions scheduling wise any questions on anything else before we get going? Had the anybody kept working on the lab from last week or from Tuesday? Had and everybody I think finished about the same point, getting your potential energy surfaces drawn. Um, anybody start getting into calculating equilibrium constants or anything? Not yet. I, I saw one nod. Good job, Elky and Emily. All right, so let's do a few practice questions about um, about thermodynamics. And thermodynamics is is the official way of basically describing equilibrium. Um, so all the energies and entropy that we were talking about, free energy and how it relates to equilibrium constants, that's all referred to as thermodynamics. And then the the new concepts we're going to add today are going to be talking about rates, which the the chemistry term for rates is kinetics. 
In other words, how do things bump into each other and how quickly do things happen? Um, but in terms of the thermodynamics, uh, if we have, we have five different cases here, I think this, this is just a practice problem from your textbook, if not yours, maybe from one of the others that I've used before. Um, if we know that delta G is positive, what does that tell us about whether the reaction is spontaneous or not? It's non-spontaneous. So positive means non-spontaneous. And does that mean that the reaction won't happen? No, it means it'll, it'll only happen a little bit. It means the equilibrium favors the reactants. So you won't make very much product. And if you start with equal amounts of reactants and product, it's going to shift to having more reactants. See if that, let's see, I'm not sure if I got the left and the right properly there. Everything mirrored, so I can't, pay, I can't keep track. You wind up making more reactants though. So if delta G is positive, that means it favors reactants. And what does that tell us about K, about equilibrium constant? It's less than one. Exactly. If K is less than one, that means that the bottom half of that, that fraction, remember K is just a fraction that's just products over reactants. If, it's, if you favor the reactants, that means the bottom half of that equation is bigger than the top half. Bottom half of that fraction is bigger than the top half, the denominator to use to use the proper word that not everybody likes using because it reminds you of middle school and learning fractions for the first time and how fun that was. I don't know, I, I didn't mind fractions, especially once we got into multiplying and dividing, I hated adding fractions and subtracting fractions. That was such a pain, find lowest common denominator and everything. Um, if we have a, a reaction where K is 0.5, Is that going to favor reactants or products? So K. Reactants. Reactants. Less than Same one. thing, right? First rule of equilibrium is products over reactants. So if K is bigger or is less than one, the denominator is bigger than the numerator. In other words, you have more reactants than products at equilibrium. Um, for the most part in OCHEM, equilibrium constants are really a lot simpler than they were back in GenCAM because we have, at most, we'll have a you know two reactants turning into two products. We don't typically do with any deal with anything that has really complicated stoichiometry like like GenCAM. Um, and I'll fre frequently, like with your cyclohexanol or cyclohexanes, um, you're, you're going to have a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Which means it's a really straightforward calculation, figuring out products um, and reactants at equilibrium. If we have a reaction where we know more specific information, a reaction is carried out at 298 Kelvin, and it has a delta H of positive 33 and a delta S of positive 150. Is that going to favor reactants or products? Probably have to do some math real quick. Remember, I'll put up the equation here that for delta G, equals delta H minus T delta S. Right, this was our products. It's gonna be Products, make sure that you're watching your units here because delta H's are usually reported in kilojoules. 
per mole and delta S is usually just joules per mole. So when we plug all that in, we get, I'm just gonna do this in the equation editor, inserting the equation here. Delta G equals positive 333 times 10 to the three joules no, I didn't like that either. Um, oh, it's because I had another set of parentheses there. Positive 33. Don't forget your time send to the third. Joules over moles. All right, I'm just going to leave it like that. Everybody knows what this is supposed to look like. That's what I get when I'm trying to type in the equation editor too quickly. Minus temperature, which is 298 Kelvin times 150 joules per mole Kelvin. That one worked. And when we plug all that in, what do we get? What do we get for a number, John? Negative 1.7. I left it in kilojoules though. Okay. So, and that, but that uh, negative 1.7 is it kilojoules. Seven. Yeah, 11.7. Yeah. Okay. So the big thing is we just want to know products minus react over reactants is the fact that it's 11. Right? So delta G is negative, which means it's spontaneous, which means it favors the products at equilibrium. K is greater than one. If we wanted to actually calculate K, we could, right? We would just use that K equals E E to the minus delta G over RT. Um, and worth remembering too, this reminds me, I was grading your, um, your simple distillation labs last night. And there were a couple people who got who got tripped up on the PV equals NRT part of, of that uh, lab um, by not paying attention to your units on R. If you Because we have two different values of R, right? This R is in joules per mole times Kelvin. The one you want for PV equals NRT, you need it in liters and atmospheres. So this one, interesting, interesting note here um, about statistical mechanics is that this R, 8.314, is equal to Boltzmann's constant, KB, that we use in, in um, uh, talking about rates, it times Avogadro's constant. Avogadro's number times Boltzmann's constant gives you R in joules per mole Kelvin. So what R really is, is actually a measure of how random particles statistically move under normal conditions. If they're non-interacting particles, they will move in such a way that you have that R value. That R value comes from, it's a fundamental constant of how statistics works. Um, at any level. And so we, we wind up with it showing up in things like K, 
um, and rate constants. And it also shows up in the ideal gas law because all of those things have to do with random particles moving in random directions. And the constant that allows us to predict some of those properties is Boltzmann's constant, um, which is why the field that Boltzmann founded about using entropy um, is known as statistical thermodynamics. It's basically using statistics and some of these ide ideas of energy um, to predict how things behave at the molecular level. Um, and I happen to know statistical thermodynamics relatively well because that is the only class I've ever had to retake for was grad school stat, stat math um, because I made a very dumb decision regarding my homework being late and turned in my friend's results instead of my own. And we were both wrong, um, which made it stand out. You know, when you turn in the wrong answer and it's exactly the same wrong answer as someone else that stands out. Um, so we both retook the class the next year. Um, so worth, worth noting that even otherwise good students sometimes uh, do that. I know that. I also know all the tricks because I thought I could get away with it too once. All right. Last couple options here. These are more general cases, and but they're really helpful to make some generalizations about how everything works. Um, because if we have this delta G equation, if we know just the sign on H and the sign on S, that can tell us a lot about whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. Right, so an exothermic reaction with a positive value for delta S of the system. So if it's exothermic, what does that tell us about delta H? It's wrong, wrong window. If it's exothermic, that means delta H is negative. Right, and so we have a negative minus a temperature, which in and temperature is always going to be what? P positive or okay. negative? It's always got to be positive, right? That's why we're we're in absolute temperature. And then if delta S is positive as well. What does that tell us about delta G? We have a negative minus negative. two positives multiplied together. So therefore, delta G under any conditions, delta G is going to be negative. Without knowing more information, we don't know how negative delta G is. We couldn't predict an equilibrium constant, but we can at least say that it's a spontaneous reaction. because. The, because with without knowing those numbers, we can still plug things in to say, okay, that's negative, that's negative, therefore delta G will always be negative. Which means what's the other case that's given here? If instead of being negative, if it's endothermic, delta H is positive, and we're going to be minus a positive temperature, and I'm just going to plug in T here, and if delta S is negative, we get a positive number minus a negative. So once again, we can make a generalization there, right? Say delta G will always be positive for this reaction in E. So if delta G is positive, it's non-spontaneous, which means K is less than one. What about if we have a case where 
we have one. So in, in D and E there, we had, we either had both of these variables were favorable for the reaction to be spontaneous, or in E, we had both of these variables were unfavorable for the reaction to be spontaneous, right? What if one of them favors being spontaneous and the other one doesn't? Doesn't it depend on temperature? Then it's going to depend on temperature, exactly. So if delta, if it's exothermic, that favors the reaction being spontaneous. But if delta S is positive, that favors the reaction being non-spontaneous. So we can't say that this reaction is always going to be spontaneous or not non-spontaneous. It's going to depend on the temperature. Because when T gets big, what happens to the, this whole piece? Just really roughly, it gets bigger, right? And so, and this is our unfavorable piece. So if T gets big, is the reaction gonna be spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Non-spontaneous? Non-spontaneous. When T gets big, our unfavorable term gets bigger. And at some point you'll cross that threshold between where you go from being favorable to unfavorable. When this told, when T is small, delta H matters the most. And delta H is favorable. So at low temp, it's spontaneous. Man, there are a lot of vowels in spontaneous. And at high temp, it's going to be non spontaneous. All right, so when you're looking at these, if you have a, a general question like this where you know the sign on delta H and delta S. Um, but you, but you don't know specifics. The way that works best for me to think about these is break that up into favorable or unfavorable from the point of view of being spontaneous. Because then you can just say, okay, my my favorable piece at low temps, my favorable piece is bigger. At high temps, my unfavorable piece is bigger. Right, rather than if you leave it in pluses and minuses in your head, you have to then do that step after the fact, um, which is fine if your brain works that way. If you want to leave them in pluses and minuses to estimate this in your head, to me, it works better to break it up into qualitative terms. If I don't have actual numbers, I want it in qualitative, more descriptive terms for, for my own internal logic. So, Sean, sorry if you kind of already said this, but if you're talking like qualitative, so low temp, high temp, where's the threshold? Good question. It's going to depend on what these numbers are. Okay. So like relative to each other? Yeah. So let's look at, let's see, we have one of these. Let's go back to the screen share here. Um, let's look at C again on here, because C is this, is one of these cases where we have a favorable piece and an unfavorable piece. So another, another way I can ask these questions is, so first off is for C, is it going to be favorable at high temps or favorable at low temps? You've got delta H is positive. Is that favorable or unfavorable? So you you always mean favorable for spontaneity, like, right? Yeah. So from from the point of view of favorable yeah. means the reaction progresses. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm imparting a value judgment on 
numbers, which doesn't always work out well. But from the point of view of the chemist, we usually want the reaction to happen. So we think of favorable means the reaction happens. Is it favorable? So when delta H, H being positive means it's endothermic. And it means that you, if you've got a positive number here or in on, it's, it's um, just like what we have drawn here, right? If you have a positive there, that makes delta G is more likely to be positive, which would be non-spontaneous. So positive delta H favors non-spontaneous. We also have a positive delta S, which favors being spontaneous. So let me adjust this. So our favorable term is the term that they, the term that favors the reaction being spontaneous is the term that has temperature attached to it, which means at high temperatures, delta G will be negative. So this reaction will be spontaneous at high temperatures and non-spontaneous at low temperatures. Let's, let's plug the numbers in. Let's okay. plug in 33,000 here. Um, and actually let's, let's solve for T. Let's say we're looking for the point, and this, this might help make this clear. Let's, we're looking for the point where it becomes spontaneous. In other words, where it switches from being positive to negative, where delta G switches from being positive to negative. What number is that? Zero. Zero. When delta G is zero, it's switching from being positive to negative, right? So if we plug zero in for delta G and we plug in the delta H value and the delta S value we have, we can solve for a temperature. And that's the temperature where it will become spontaneous. And then bear with me because I'm, I'm helping you qualitatively with this because then we're gonna plug in a point a little bit lower than that and a point a little bit higher than that. And look at what that does to the delta G, All right? So. If we want to solve for T, we plug in all of our numbers here. And we'll get, so we say delta G equals zero, which is 33.3. Times ten to the fourth minus T, which is what we're solving for, times one fifty. I'm leaving off the units here for the sake of of just doing algebra. So when we solve for this, we're going to get we're going to get thirty three thousand equals T equals one fifty T. So T equals Thirty-three thousand over one fifty, which gives us two hundred and twenty. And if we did track our units the whole way through, we'd find out that our joules per mole over joules per mole cancel out. We're left in just Kelvin. So what is, how does that help us? 
Well, that tells us that that's the temperature where T equals zero. Or sorry, where delta G equals zero. That's the, that is the point where our favorable and our unfavorable cancel out and add up to zero. So if we, if we make our, so our term that favors spontaneity was the second term, right? Because ent the entropy term was positive, which means with that negative sign in there, that means that when this second term gets bigger, we are more likely for it to be, not more likely, it is more spontaneous. When, when the second term gets bigger. If we plug in, if we plug in 221 Kelvin, we're going to get a negative number here. Actually, we already did that, right? We did at 298 Kelvin. When we plugged in 298 Kelvin, we got a number for delta G that was negative 11 kilojoules per mole, right? If we plug in 200 Kelvin instead, a number that's under this threshold, we'll get a positive number for delta G, which means non-spontaneous. Right, so the so what this allows, breaking this up into two pieces allows us to either say always spontaneous, never spontaneous, spontaneous at high temperatures or spontaneous at low temperatures. And you can draw basically a Punnett square for this. A Punnett square is just a way of, of writing out all the possibilities when you have two variables, right? Like if you think of um, a coin flip, you could draw a Punnett square that has every possible outcome of flipping two coins, right? It could be heads, heads, it could be heads, tails, it could be tails, heads, it could be tails, tails. If we do the same thing here, if we have our delta H side and our delta S side, if If delta H is negative, that favors the reaction being spontaneous, right? And we can even color code this. So the entropy term, if it's negative, the entropy term favors spontaneous being spontaneous and if delta h is positive it's non spontaneous favors being non spontaneous if delta s is positive is that favors being spontaneous or non spontaneous the entropy of the system is increasing Spontaneous. It favors being spontaneous. And delta S is negative. All right, so two of these cases, both of these terms agree with each other. If delta H is negative and delta S is positive, it will always be spontaneous. If delta S is negative and delta H is positive, it will always be non-spontaneous. For the other two cases, that's when it depends on temperature. Right, and to remind yourself that this that this term has is the one that has the temperature associated. We could even write it as T delta S. So when this term gets bigger is when T is greater. 
when T is big, the red term becomes more important. So therefore at high temperatures, if you have a positive enthalpy and a positive delta S, at high temperatures, the red term becomes more important because entropy is the one that has T attached to it. If you have a negative delta S and a negative enthalpy, at high temperatures, the red term becomes more important and it becomes non-spontaneous. Right? It's a little tricky conceptually. This is, this is one case where um, it's actually a lot easier to answer these questions if I just give you the numbers because you can just plug and chug and not have to think about it. Um, but we don't always know exact numbers. But what we will know a lot of the time, just by looking at a reaction, we can tell whether or not the enthalpy is, is or sorry, we can tell whether the entropy is gonna be positive or negative. And we can measure the enthalpy really easily just by if we let the reaction happen, if the temperature goes down, delta H is positive. If temperature goes up, delta H is negative because we're just looking at exothermic versus endothermic, right? So it's valuable to be able to think about it in these general terms, even if it makes it harder to actually conceptualize what's going on. It's a more complete picture of what's happening. Let's do one more example. This one, I will just give you the answers or the numbers. If we have a delta H for a reaction and delta S for a reaction, specifically the conversion of diamond to graphite, we, can, we have numbers for these. If we want to know if the reaction is spontaneous at room temperature, there are a couple ways we can approach it. We can plug and chug. Or we can also look at these in terms of their values, positive and negative, and see where it falls on our Punnett square. because exothermic favors being spontaneous, right? And delta S being positive favors spontaneous. So does it matter that it's at room temperature? This reaction should be spontaneous no matter what at any temperature. The equilibrium favors diamonds turning back into graphite at atmospheric pressure. So why don't we see that? It takes a long time. It takes a long time. If you started at the beginning of the universe, if you started with a one carat diamond, um, after 14 billion years at room temperature, that diamond would still be not noticeably changed to graphite. Despite the fact equilibrium favors diamonds turning into graphite, the rate does not. The kinetics are so slow that after 14 billion years, you basically have exactly what you have. Have good pay, um, which is kind of cool. It's Dash's first day back at school last week. Last week we found out we'd been exposed to COVID, so he didn't get a chance to go last week. But our tests all came back negative, so he gets to go back today. Um. All right. If we wanted an actual number for delta G, if we want to find K, all we do is plug in our numbers. Plug in two ninety eight for Kelvin. Um, 
and plug in the numbers we're given here, make sure to turn kilojoules into joules, we could get delta G at room temperature, which then we could plug into our equilibrium constant expression. Um, and I will do that over break so we can see what that process looks like. And then we'll get into rates because turns out thermodynamics is only half of the story. Something can be thermodynamically spontaneous without ever occurring in the real world. So let's take a break. Let's come back at five till.
Hey, Cody, what's up? You confused with the uh, K equation? Are you supposed to invert the symbol on that uh, delta G? So I didn't invert it. There, there's a negative sign in this equation. So I, I did not, I did not just drop a negative. I had a negative which I plugged in there. So negative of a negative. Oh, okay, cool. And that's that's because that there's that um, in terms of the entropy of the universe, there was, we want, if the entropy of the universe is increasing, it's spontaneous. But it, back in our definition of delta G, we said there was a negative sign associated with, with entropy of the universe, just right. to make the equation look neater. Okay. And so that means that this equation um, would have that that term associated with that negative associated with it too. So that a negative of a negative gives us a number greater than one. I always get tripped up on that. Thanks, man. No problem. And if I bug you one more time, what are not at all. 
I'm getting a little bit tripped up on the units for Delta G. Okay. So if we were, if we were watching way back. Oh, I think I see it now because you've got K on top and then K on bottom. So K cancels. Okay. You got it? I think so. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I left it off right here as well. But yeah, there's K is in our entropy units have K built into the unit. And then you've got your temperature there too. So K cancels out K. We're, and so delta G is in joules per mole. Thank you. Um, also, I thought worth sharing um, from a, a very famous statistical mechanics book called States of Matter. How, how people frequently feel about statistical mechanics. Um, actually, Boltzmann, so Boltzmann's the one that I showed the, the bust of and who had the entropy equation written on his grave. Um, and he actually was, um, was driven to suicide because he was a very sensitive guy. And he, he, when he presented statistical mechanics to the scientific world, um, he received such harsh criticism and dismissal from everyone um, that it, it drove him into a deep depression and he wound up committing suicide like six months after he first published the theory of entropy um, because of how harsh the scientific community was with him. Um, I mean, clearly he had some underlying emotional issues as well, um, but uh, just just shows you just how harsh scientists can be um, to other scientists, even the ones that are at the top of their game. Um, Sean, Sean, was that yeah. because they just didn't want him to succeed, or was it just a new a new area that they just didn't believe in, or why were they? So it was hard? probably a combination of the of the two. You know, scientists have a tendency to you know they might be really harsh with each other, um, but if somebody's you know, results are inarguable then on it's, and it's not really groundbreaking in any way, they're not going to attack them that much on their actual research. So it's some, probably some combination of the fact that it was really new and nobody trusted it. And they probably didn't like him as a person as well. There's probably a lot of that. There's that kind of politics at when you get to that, the highest level of science as well. Um, they were you know, probably I'm, flat earthers. Yeah, exactly. No, it, um, you know, it's it's a lot like Einstein and, and Niels Bohr. Einstein spent most of most of his life trying to disprove quantum mechanics because he didn't like the implications of his own early research. Um, he didn't trust any of the interpretations of quantum mechanics that relied on probability. And so he he didn't like his own stuff, but he was, you know, confident enough. He was Albert effing Einstein. Um, so, you know, when you win a Nobel Prize, that tends to help your self-confidence a bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, you know, Mendeleev is another good example of that, right? Mendeleev, the guy who invented the periodic table, um, didn't get an element named after him till he'd been dead for 100 years um, because he was just that much of an asshole in life. Nobody liked him. In fact, they named elements specifically um, to piss him off sometimes. Um, germanium is the one that comes to mind. Mendeleev was Russian and the Russians and the Germans in the 1800s hated each other. And, uh, and so the element that Mendeleev's periodic table predicted should be there and was finally discovered was named germanium, basically is a big middle finger to Mendeleev. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of personality that comes out sometimes too in the politics. So, if we want to look at, at rates, if we get back to our um, example here of diamond being converted to graphite, it's non -spo it's spontaneous at any temperature. And if we actually look at the numbers, we end up with getting a, um, an equilibrium constant of about three, which may means at equilibrium, you should have about three times as many of your molecules should be in the diamonds or should be in the graphite state compared to your diamond state. 
that's not what we actually see though. And the reason is because the rate is so slow, right? And so your, the rate of a reaction is dependent on a couple of things. It depends on your concentration of what you start with. If you're dealing with something like a gas or a solution, if you're dealing with a liquid reactant or a solid reactant, then the rate doesn't really depend on how much you start with, right? Because it's got a constant concentration. Do um, you guys remember learning that back in, in Gen Chem? We, you know, radioactivity is the one that frequently gets used here because radioactive materials are um, almost all solid. And so radioactive material, the half-life of that material doesn't depend on how much you started with because it's a solid. Um, the half-life wouldn't depend on it anyway, but the amount of time it takes um, is, doesn't depend on how much you start with because of that, that constant concentration. Um, so K winds up being really, really significant here because the other thing about concentrations is that they're, they're numbers that aren't that extreme, right? A really low concentration might be 0 0.001 moles per liter. A really, really high concentration might be 10 moles per liter. That's not that big of a number or that small of a number in terms of talking about 14 billion years um, of you know, being the age of the universe. So K winds up being the most significant part of this. And K is gonna have its own equation. Um, if we have a more complicated rate law, so this, this equation is known as the rate law. And it's always gonna have a general form of rate of reaction equals K times your concentrations. Um, exactly what the concentrations look like, whether or not they factor into this is gonna depend on whether they're solid or not. It's gonna depend on, um, on the actual mechanism as well. Because what we're really looking at with these rate laws is we're looking at what is the slowest step in this process. If it's a multi-step process, we're looking at what's the slowest point in this process. Um, and typically that, that either relies on, if it's something like um, cyclohexane flipping around, um, then it's gonna look more like it's, you're not gonna have B involved there because you only have one reactant, right? But if you have two molecules that have to run into each other for the reaction to happen, your rate law might look more complicated because you need, you're, it's gonna be dependent on how much of each of those pieces you have. Um, if we look at the, you know, the actual reactions are a lot like cars running into each other, or let's just say um, uh, pool balls, billiard balls. Let's say that a reaction happens anytime a stripe runs into a solid on a pool table. If there are no stripes left, your reaction rate's gonna be really low, right? If you need stripe to run into a solid and you don't have any stripe, your solid can do whatever it wants and it's never gonna react. As you increase the concentration of each of them, your rate is gonna go up because it's depending on both of those things running into each other and that's just based purely on probability. All right, so we use the term first order, second order, or third order to describe these reactions. Um, and the order is we usually find this experimentally. We can predict it using doing calculations where we find out what the energy is um, of the transition state and what molecules are involved in the transition state. Um, but it's usually easier to do it experimentally. If you carry out the reaction at a certain temperature with A being constant and B being constant, and measure your initial rate. And then you do it again, except you double your concentration of B. If it's first order in B, your rate should double if you double a concentration of B. Does that sound familiar? Call that the method of initial rates. 
you know, usually the problem that would give you a table and say, this is experiment one, here's your two starting concentrations and here's your rate. And then experiment two, you double one of those starting concentrations and look at what happens to the rate. Um, this is actually more helpful than just figuring out the rate law because it also helps us figure out what is the slow step in a reaction. What is the rate determining step in a reaction? Because it's not always the first step. It's not always A has to run into B. Sometimes the slowest step is B needs to flip itself into the right conformer. And that, if that's the slowest step is B flipping itself into the right conformer, it doesn't matter how much A you have because B is, the amount of B you have is gonna depend, is going to determine the rate. So even for a, a, a relatively complicated, let's say we have a, a, a theoretical reaction where the stoichiometry looks like 2A plus B goes to product. What, if, if B turning itself into a different conformer that looks like maybe the slowest step is B turns into a lot of times we'll indicate it just by putting an asterisk. Turns into B star. Hi, Valence. Time for breakfast. Okay, go have your breakfast. Close the door behind you. Okay. Thanks. If B turning into B star is your slowest step, it doesn't matter how much A you have. Your rate law is going to just be rate equals K times concentration of B. More B means the reaction will happen faster because you have a higher probability of this happening. But adding more A does not speed up this process. Right, so the rate laws, when we start talking about mechanisms, rate laws wind up being really important. Um, some of the other factors that affect the rate constant, not the rate law, or the rate itself. If you want to look at factors affecting the rate constant K, it actually looks very similar to our equation for for equilibrium constant, right? Because this this graph right here, this is Boltzmann's largest contribution to to physics and chemistry is he came up with the function that describes the probability of molecules having a certain energy as a function of temperature. So if you look at the number of molecules, treat this like a bell curve, like a probability curve, except the difference with a Boltzmann distribution is you can't have molecules that have a negative amount of kinetic energy, right? At various temperatures, you're going to have a, a distribution of energies of your molecules. The actual, but you can never have something where the molecule has a negative kinetic energy. So it's not a true bell curve. It's not really a, a Gaussian distribution because it has to be shifted and normalized in such a way that it can go down to zero, but not past it. And that's why a lot of things have the same general form. This is actually the function that will give you this shape. If you plug in a certain temperature and you plug in a bunch of different energies and R is a constant, you wind up graphing this shape. And so what, what this is actually going to say is it, it allows us to say, okay, how many of the molecules are going to have enough energy to be above a certain threshold? And so that's why we wind up with, with e the activation energy affecting rate so much is because as you increase, as you increase T, this, this uh, shape basically flattens out. At a higher T, you'll have a higher average kinetic energy. Imagine I could draw that smoothly, which means a larger percentage of the molecules have enough energy to make it over that activation energy. At a lower T, we'll make it a darker blue, 
So it's more like ice. If you get to a lower energy, your Boltzmann distribution will look like this, which means if I clear out the red one, only a very tiny number of your molecules have enough energy to make it above that transition state. So this is why temperature plays such a big role and activation energy plays such a big role in rates is because it changes the shape of this Boltzmann curve. The more you can flatten it out, the more you can speed up the reaction because a higher percentage of the molecules will have enough energy to go over that transition state barrier. Right, so those are the two fundamental pieces that make the biggest difference in your in your equilibrium constant. This A, it's it's uh, related to the entropy and the probability that the two that two molecules run into each other. So A has to do with how many molecules are involved in the transition state. If there's only one molecule, if it's a state, if it's a transition state that looks like B flipping to B star where only one molecule is involved, you've got about the same amount of entropy on both sides. So, and you don't, you're not relying on two random objects running into each other. So in this case, A would be really close to one and we can basically not worry about it. If it's a transition state where you rely, where it's a really improbable thing that has to, you know, that where you need A to run into B and they both have to be facing the right direction at the right time, and they have to have enough energy at the same time, then A winds up being a more significant piece of this equation. There we go. That's a better drawing than what I when I did. Right. And they even used red because red is hot, high temperature. Um, the other thing that can affect this a lot. And it's really affecting one of the the first two that we talked about um, is if we if we catalyze a reaction. Basically, if we can change the mechanism, if we can change the steps that it has to go through to get from products to reactants, we can basically go around the activation energy. So let's um, if we think about it as one way to think about this is if you think about your reactants as being a bunch of ping pong balls in a cardboard box and you, you're sitting there shaking the box that's representing temperature and all of those balls in the box have a certain probability of having enough energy to pop out of the top and every time a molecule pops out of the top of the box that represents a reaction happening if you if I wanted that reaction to happen more often, I could shake the box harder. That would be like in, that would be like increasing the temperature. Or I can add a catalyst by basically if I took one side of the box and I cut a big hole in it. Now they don't have to have enough energy to make it out the top of the box. They just have to have enough energy to make it through the hole. So we're basically going around the high activation energy by adding another route. And that's, that's what ca uh, catalysis is really doing. That's what enzymes in your body are doing. That's what your catalytic converter is doing, right? Any time you hear the word catalysis, that's all it's doing is it's, you're adding something to the reaction that changes the mechanism and lowers the activation rate or the activation energy. Um, in that A term is, again, it, it's, known as the frequency factor um, and sterics will, will sometimes play a role with this as well. If, if you need your molecule of A, let's say we have some, let's see if I have a reaction on the next one or if I can, yeah. So if we have some molecule that's going to react that looks like 
So one of the first reactions we're going to look at is going to be a substitution reaction where halogens can be basically pushed off of, of an alkane and replaced with something else that's got a, a partial negative charge. If our two reactants are, let's say our other reactant is hydroxide. Hydroxide is commonly used because it's a strong base. It's got a negative charge. It's going to be attracted to the partial positive here on carbon. And when it hits carbon in the right spot, it can basically push the chlorine away. The chlorine gets bumped off of the molecule and you replace it with an OH. And I'm just, I'm just setting this up so you, we can see an example of how frequency factor matters here. So don't worry about the mechanism itself right now. Um, if, if the hydroxide came in on the other side, if it ran into the chlorine over here, it's not going to react with the chlorine, right? Because the chlorine's a partial negative too. So you have a negative and a negative, and they're going to push each other away. Nothing happens. So your reactant has to bump into the other reactant from the right direction for a reaction to happen. And not only that, we can make it harder to do that. If I replace these hydrogens with bigger pieces, like methyls, Now, all of a sudden, there's a lot more stuff getting in the way of this hydroxide coming in here, right? So not only does it have to come in from the right side, it also has to get past these other things that are in the way. And so those, those two different versions of the same reaction might have really close to the same activation energy because the transition state's gonna look pretty much the same in both cases. You need the hydroxide to come in here and attach and you need your chlorine to leave. But they're not gonna happen at the same rate because the frequency factor is going to be a lot smaller. It's a lot smaller probability of not only do these things have to run into each other, their orientation has to be perfect in order for the, for the hydroxide to be able to sneak in past these methyls that are in the way. Right, so, and that's, that's what that A term is representing um, in the, um, in your, your rate constant expression. A is basically how like, if A and B run into each other, how likely are they to react? Right, and so there's, it takes into account geometry, it takes into account you know, how big the reactive piece is on each molecule, how much stuff is in the way. Um, and it's not something that we can typically calculate very easily. Frequency factors are really hard to calculate. Transition state energies are actually really easy to calculate, not really easily. Um, they're a lot easier than frequency factors because frequency factors, you have to look at the physical space. And so a lot of times what we will do in this class, I'll either give you A or I'll tell you to just assume A is one. So Sean, um, is, is A what Boltzmann was working on for so many years or? Um, I don't, I'd have to look more specifically. The biggest piece was that was this entire thing. It was this function itself um, that, that, tied the activation energy and delta G for equilibrium constants together and tied it to rate constants because they didn't have a mathematical way of describing what happened to your rate constant when temperature went up until Boltzmann. And, and so some of, some of, I think where he got his harshest pushback, I think was on A because everybody could see that for the same reaction as you, they could all do their own experiments say, well, I, when I increase my temperature, Boltzmann's equation predicts the rate constant really, really well. Um, but nobody liked the idea of A, even if it kind of made sense because you couldn't calculate it well. Um, and it seemed like there was not a good theoretical underpinning of what was happening. They didn't really know what A was, so they didn't trust it. It almost just seems like mathematically convenient to put like everything else 
just, just put it in front of it. Yeah, it's it's a lot like when we have these exponentials, right? When in terms of calculus, um, it's basically like your plus C when you do an integral. It's like there's there's going to be some other term involved here. We don't know what all the variables are that go into A. So we're just going to call it a constant and we're going to have to measure A for every reaction instead of being able to calculate it, which bothered everybody that wanted to be able to calculate things from at this time there was a big push to calculate things from from first principles um, meaning using no measured numbers other than some constants that were the same for everything so like r um and they could not rationalize all the different variables and mathematically describe all the different variables that go into a and i'm still i'm not sure we we have ways of approximating it i don't think we have perfect way of calculating a still to this point yeah it seems like a lot <laughs> it is a lot um so if we want to look at one of the big things that we one of the ways we can act we can control how how much product we make or which product we make um is basically by paying attention to these kinetics and thermodynamics. In particular, um, you know, there's, I'm not sure if I've said it yet in this class, but I really like Interstellar's description of Murphy's Law as that's the perfect description of statistical mechanics and chemistry in general. Whatever can happen does happen. Um, and so we always have competing reactions happening. We always have side reactions and byproducts being formed that we don't care about or that we don't want to happen, that we want to minimize how much of this side reaction happens because that gives us a product we can't use. Um, so controlling that, a lot of times we have to pay attention to things that we use what's called thermodynamic control or kinetic control to basically favor one, re one product versus another product. And and we can describe that in terms of potential energy surfaces. Um, because if we look at the, the PES on the left, um, this pathway that makes um, C plus D is favorable both according to equilibrium and according to kinetics. Right? There's both the, it's both a lower activation energy which means it'll happen faster and it's favored by equilibrium as well because it's more downhill in energy. That's not always the case. We will frequently have reactions where kinetics favors making one set of products and thermodynamics, meaning equilibrium, favors making the other set of products. So in this case, on the, the case on the right-hand side, if we, if we use um, if the reaction conditions, if we manipulate the reaction conditions to make the kinetic product, basically, if we keep the temperature below a certain point, then very, very few of the molecules have enough energy to make it all the way up here. So statistically, we can favor making E and F if we keep the temperature low, below some certain threshold. And it's really not threshold so much as it is a, a spectrum, right? At one temperature, you might get 99% of your desired product. If we're trying to make E and F, let's say at room temperature, it's 99% E and F. If you go to a higher temperature, it might be 98% E and F, and you get 2% of this side product. If you go to even higher temperatures, you're going to keep, you're going to make more and more of this undesired product. Your reaction will happen faster, but you'll wind up making the more thermodynamically favored product, the one that's favored by equilibrium instead of the one that's favored by rate. Right? So your reaction goes faster, but you're going to wind up with the most stable product as opposed to the one that's, that's easier to make. All right, and so that's what's referred to as kinetic, the kinetic product or the thermodynamic product. 
the thermodynamically favored product is the one that's more downhill in energy that equilibrium favors. The kinetically favored product is the one that's made faster that has a lower activation energy. And sometimes they're the same, like this example on the left. All right, let's, so we've already kind of talked about this, these, the activation, I've been using the terms a little bit interchangeably. Um, the activation energy is the barrier that you have to make it over to get from products to reactants. The geometry, the shape of the molecules, when that happens is called the transition state. So they're, they're technically two different things, but they, you can use the terms very, very similarly, right? But if we're talking about the actual shape of the molecules, we're talking about the transition state. And if we're talking about the energy, it's the activation energy. But this is tied to what we did in lab on Tuesday, right? Because if we have the transition states are the highest energy point that it goes through, that would be like our boat conformer or our half chair where it was higher in energy. The geometry is the shape where the atoms are and the, um, and the activation energy is what is the energy of that geometry, of that shape, right? So, um, and typically if it's a single step reaction, especially your transition state is gonna look like it's halfway in between products and reactants. If our, if our reactants are methyl bromine or is um, bromomethane, and our products are chloromethane, our transition state is going to look like bromine coming is leaving, chlorine is coming in at the same time. And so it's kind of kind of look halfway in between products and reactants. Right. And there's going to be some amount of energy associated with that shape. And that's our, our activation energy. The thing is, we don't always have a one-step reaction. If we have a one-step reaction, then your potential energy surface is really easy. You have reactants, you have products, you have a transition state in between. If it's a multi-step reaction, like a ring flip, our potential energy surface is gonna look a little more complicated because you don't just go straight from reactants to products, you have to go through some some intermediate in the middle that might that's not as stable necessarily as either reactants or products. And don't pay, you know, it doesn't matter exactly what the steps are here, but if we look at what's in between at this intermediate, the intermediate is has to be stable. It has to be at the bottom of a potential energy well. So this could be like, if you're trying to, if you consider uh, altitude, your energy, if you're trying to go from Sacramento to Reno, there are more than one, there's more than one route you can take, right? You could take I-80 and go straight over Donner Pass. That'd be a, like a single step reaction. You've got your, your react, reactants is Sacramento, your products is Reno. You've got one transition state in between. If you decided you wanted to go through Lake Tahoe on your way to Reno, then you would go up over Echo on 50, and then you would come back down to lake level. And then you would go up again through Spooner or Mount Rose or whatever route you were taking. But the, the difference between a transition state and an intermediate is an intermediate is more stable. A transition state's always going to be shaped so that if you put a marble at the top, it's going to roll one way or the other. An intermediate is at the bottom of a potential energy well. So if we put a marble right here, it wouldn't necessarily roll one way or the other. It's being cupped in that intermediate state. If you gave it a bunch of energy by shaking it around, it'll go one way or the other way to the more stable states. But there's a, there's a difference between intermediates and transition states. And it's based on, are you at the top? Are you at a pass or are you at lake level? 
right? Um, so we're going to get into talking about the actual, some actual mechanism steps now um, that we can use to describe some of these things. We're going to deal with a couple different categories of reactions in this class. There's a lot more categories, but they're, this is our really broad distinction. Um, and one of the, the biggest category of reactions we're going to see in OCHEM is polar reactions. And polar reactions are exactly what they sound like. It means that, that you are moving electrons around and that you're going to have partial positives, partial negatives, or full ions participating in the reaction. Um, and so a lot of times, a huge chunk of what we look at in this class is going to be figuring out where the partial charges are. So for instance, if you have chlorine attached to a carbon, we have chloromethane. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon is. So if you look at where all the electrons are, there's more of the electrons are around the chlorine than there are around the carbon. So this figure here is showing the blue is a positive charge, the red is negative charge. So that means that there's a partial positive on that carbon that's a result of the fact that you have a difference in electronegativity here. So going back to Gen Chem, where we just learned how to recognize this is polar, that one's not, this is why it matters. One of the reasons why it matters, because it's going to allow us to predict what reactions will happen. Because if we do something else, like lithium's actually got a, a high enough electronegativity that you can actually make a covalent bond between lithium and carbon. But carbon is way more electronegative than lithium is. So in this case, if you make, if you put a metal attached to a carbon, carbon is more electronegative. In that case, your negative charge is around the carbon and your positive charge or partial positive is going to be around the metal. That's going to fundamentally change what other molecules this will interact with and how. Right? If we put, if we did something similar to the my first example reaction we did, where we had hydroxide coming in here with a negative charge. Here, hydroxide with its negative charge is going to be attracted to that carbon. If we put hydroxide over here with the with the lithium. The hydroxide is going to be attracted to the lithium side of the molecule and it'll attach to the lithium and pull the lithium off as opposed to attaching to the carbon. So we actually can direct which part of the molecule reacts by changing what what the um, where the partial charges are. Right. And so with that in mind. Um, we are going to define a couple terms that we use to describe these. Um, and those, the most common one um, that we're going to use is nucleophiles. So file from the Greek meaning loves. So a nucleophile is, is a molecule that loves a nucleus, that is attracted to a nucleus. So in other words, a nucleophile is either going to have a partial negative or a full negative charge because that negative charge is going to be attracted to a nucleus because nuclei are positively charged. So nu again, nucleophiles are electron rich molecules that are attracted to partial positives or positive charges. Right? It's it's just another way of talking about positives or attracted to negatives. Um, if we have these two molecules, either of these molecules can be a nucleophile. The one on the left has a full negative charge, it's called ethoxide. The one on the right is ethanol, but they both have an oxygen attached to a carbon, right? Which means they're both polar molecules. 
and you're in both cases you're going to have a partial negative on the or a full negative on the oxygen because the oxygen is the most electronegative element in here in either of these so the oxygen in these molecules is a good nucleophile just based on what you guys know about charges and remember that this symbol here that that's a see if i can be, draw it more carefully a lowercase delta means a partial charge that's a partial negative which of these would we expect to be a stronger nucleophile what's going to be more attracted to a positive charge would be the molecule on the left yeah something with a negative charge is almost always going to be a stronger nucleophile than the same molecule without that negative charge, right? Because this oxygen only has one bond and, it, and it's most stable with two. So that it's going to seek out partial positives or positive charges to try and balance its charge out so it adds up to zero now something that's already neutral, even if it has a partial negative, is not going to be nearly as strong of a nucleophile. And you can see it's the same molecule, just protonated versus deprotonated, right? So we can take ethanol and we can turn it into a really good nucleophile by deprotonating it. If we can put it into conditions that pull the hydrogen off of ethanol, pull the acidic proton off, we can make it a really good nucleophile. This is why we started with acid base reactions because acid base reactions are kind of like these nucleophilic reactions as well, right? We're just transferring a, a proton in that case. Um, the opposite side of the coin, the opposite of a nucleophile is an electrophile. Makes sense, right? Nucleophiles are have extra electrons and are attracted to a positive charge, electrophiles are missing electrons or have partial positives and will seek out um, molecules that have extra electrons or have extra have electrons that can share. Right, so that's going to be instead of talking about um, just talking about the charges, we will continue to do that. Um, but a lot of times we'll be talking about from the point of view of a single molecule and and we'll say, OK, and then a nucleophile comes in and does this. And then or and then an electrophile comes in and is attracted to this part of the molecule. So in OCHEM, a lot of times we're going to say, you know, have a molecule in mind that we're starting with. And we're going to say, what's going to happen when we add hydroxide to it? And we're going to say, oh, hydroxide, negative charge it's going to act as a nucleophile, right? So, but all of these polar reactions have a molecule you could characterize as the electrophile and a nucleophile. Just like all of our acid base reactions had to have an acid and a base. And sometimes you can have one molecule that can act as both a nucleophile or an electrophile. So in this case, if we have this, this molecule, which you don't know how to name yet, and that's fine. We haven't learned how to name it yet. What parts are going to act as a nucleophile? What parts of this molecule, one or more, are going to be attracted to a positive charge? The oxygen? Oxygen is going to be one of our most common nucleophiles in any in any type of functional group. Oxygen is pretty much always going to have a negative or a partial negative charge because it's so electronegative. So the oxygen could be a nucleophile. Is there any other part of the molecule that that um, we would expect to be attracted to a positive charge? Or if I flip the question around, 
would a positive charge be attracted to any other part of this molecule? Positive charges are attracted to electrons, Negative. right? Negatives, but also just electrons in general. So it wouldn't be a strong nucleophile because there's no partial charges on it. But this part of the molecule has extra electrons. So it would be attractive to something that had a positive charge, which means we could flip around that logic and say it's attracted to a positive charge because just because we have extra electrons around relative to the number of nuclei. The charges still add up to zero, but the fact that we have a pi bond, pi bonds can act as nucleophiles as well. Because if we added in something just as simple as an H plus, that H plus could be attracted over here. And actually I'm drawing my arrows backwards um, and I'm gonna get specific about drawing arrows. So I'm, I should start making sure I'm doing it right. Um, electrons are much smaller than nuclei, right? Electrons therefore are moving faster at the same temperature. So we are always draw our mechanisms that are showing steps in a reaction are always going to be from the point of view of electrons moving towards nuclei. We're going to treat the nuclei like they don't move because they move so much slower than the electrons do. So when I'm drawing my arrows showing what what attractive forces there are, I'm going to draw it from the point of view of the electrons being attracted. And these electrons could be attracted as well. These electrons can be pulled away by a positive charge moving around. So both of those parts of the molecule could act as a nucleophile. John, how about lone pairs? So lone pairs, um, nucleophiles need to have either lone pairs or pi bonds. Um, basically, you can't have a partial negative if you don't have a lone pair somewhere. Um, you definitely can't have a full negative charge without a lone pair. So would it not, would it be incorrect to draw a partial negative symbol around that pi bond area in this instance? We would not typically draw a partial negative there because the bonds on either side, and you, you could, it wouldn't be wrong. It would just be a little bit different than the way we'd normally do. We would normally just say that that part of the molecule is electron rich or it has more electron density. Um, but typically we're gonna talk about partial positives and negatives in the context of on either side of a single bond. It's gonna be the more common way we're gonna discuss it. But no, it wouldn't technically be wrong. It would just be a little bit different than the way the book presents it. Is there any part of this molecule that would be attracted to electrons? Is it the hydrogen? The hydrogen, any partial positive is gonna be attracted to electrons. Same with the if the hydrogen wound up being attracted to another pair of electrons, that's actually gonna result in an acid base reaction. You're just gonna wind up pulling the hydrogen off of this and be left with a negative charge on the oxygen. Is there any other part? Not really. You could make the argument that because these pi, pi electrons are in between the two carbons, the two carbons on either side are good targets for a nucleophile, which would mean that they're technically acting as an electrophile. But those those pi bonds kind of occupy enough space that they're kind of more or less going to cover those carbons. We'll look at some you know, how we can judge that. You guys learn to um, develop an intuition what part of the molecule is the most important part. And it's usually going to be by tracking the where are there extra electrons and what part of the molecule has partial positives that could react with extra electrons. Um, interesting side note, historically, since we only have five minutes left, 
that that approximation where we say that the, the nuclei are so much bigger than the electrons that we're just going to assume that they don't move. Um, that's actually Oppenheimer's major contribution to physics and chemistry. Oppenheimer, who ran the Manhattan Project during World War II, the reason that he was put in charge of the Manhattan Project was one, the US government felt like they could trust him, um, despite him being from Germany originally. And two, his big contribution was what's known as the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which basically says we only need to worry about the electrons moving because the nuclei move so slowly relative to the electrons, we, the electrons, we can just call their, their motion zero for the purpose of running calculations. Um, and so that's that calculations that you guys ran on Tuesday those use that that op born Oppenheimer approximation basically it's saying we're going to just not let the nuclei move and see where the electrons wind up and that simplifies it enough that we can actually get a number um, and it, that's also how we're going to approach writing these mechanisms treat the nuclei like they're not moving and you're just going to draw where the electrons are attracted So in, with that in mind, nucleophile is a much more common way of thinking about things because the nucleophile is talking about where the electrons are going to be pulled. Electrophiles are, it's a useful concept to know the opposite of a nucleophile, but nucleophiles is a much more common term to use because we're usually thinking about the point of view of the electrons moving, not the nuclei. All right, let's go ahead and stop there. That's a convenient place to stop. Um, Tuesday, that means we don't have too much left in the way of these um, slides. Um, so I'll make sure we have some good practice and um, you know we can take our time, make sure, answer any questions you guys have on the practice test that you'll be working on over the weekend. Um, which, speaking of, Where did I go? Yeah, that one. Um, you guys have, this is last, oh, I forgot to change the title. Um, I will re-upload this in a second, changing the title from midterm exam to practice, practice exam, so that if you go to the tutoring center for help, um, you won't get uh, any, any flack for bringing in a test. Um, the, you guys have the knowledge and information to do everything then up to nine and 10. Nine and 10, if you wanted to start practicing on some of this stuff, it's, it is in the book, looking at these mechanistic patterns. Um, but everything up to eight, we've covered so far. And then Tuesday, we'll do nine and 10, cover that material. I think that's all you need to know for this. This is last year's midterm. Um, so I will rewrite. This is how I how I usually do practice tests. I give you last year's test um, so that, uh, and then I rewrite it completely so that I know that nobody has seen a copy of, of this year's test before. Um, good. Thinking, send yeah, messages on Canvas is a good way to get in touch with each other to, to um, if you guys wanted to work on Zoom to work on this. Um, or I have office hours. Let's see, today is Thursday, which makes them from three to four today, or two two thirty to three thirty tomorrow. Um, I will be around. All right. Any questions before we go? We turn this in by next Thursday. Um, yeah, by Thursday at midnight. So you have, so if you wanted to use Thursday's lecture time next week to get some final questions answered, um, you can, you don't have to have it turned in when you come to class on Thursday, but it should be, you probably want it mostly done when you get there, at least have your questions. And you clear. said this is taking place of this is, <coughs> is that what you said earlier? Or 
the beginning? Yeah, so I'm I'm just going, I want you guys to spend the time on the material, finishing up assignments and stuff, including this new one that I just gave you. So instead of the quiz, be working on this over the weekend. Cool. Um, in the spirit of the quiz though, don't wait until Tuesday. Don't give yourself five days off because a lot of the stuff will be really hard to come back to then, right? So spend at least a little bit of time during over the weekend thinking about some of these, remembering some of these concepts. Uh, anything else? All right, let's, I'll stop recording. All right, then.